Thank you all very much. We'll call today's meeting to order. Thank you all so very, very much for being here today. And uh, again, this is, I guess, our first full board meeting of the new year. So thank you, board members, for being here and appreciate everyone else being here also. I've been advised that there are no individuals who have signed in for, uh, for speaking. So uh, we will move along on the agenda. And I would ask, obviously, Ms. Leanne Franklin to come up, who's the director of our pastoral services. And Leanne, if I could say one thing before you start, because I think it's appropriate time to say this. And, and Robert, I may be getting ahead of you also, but you know, I had the pleasure of serving with this man when I first came on the board. And many of you may have, may have heard that uh, Bruce Capehart passed away. And he served on this board for many years. And, and we appreciate his service to the board. And the service is Monday. I got to see him toward the end at the hospital when he was dealing with his cancer and, and the situation and talked to his wife, Sherry, who many of you know, who's involved in various things in Arlington. So again, we wish Bruce and Sherry and the entire family there in our thoughts and prayers. And in so saying that, I will, Leanne, if you would now lead us in a word of prayer after that, please join me in the pledge of the flag. Thank you. Will you please join me in prayer? We gather this afternoon grateful for the life of Bruce and for all those who serve JPS. We ask that you be with everyone who loved Bruce, especially Sherry, and we thank you for his service. We thank you for all those in this room. We're grateful for the wisdom, compassion, and leadership of those here today. We ask that you guide thoughts, inform decisions, and strengthen bonds as all work together to benefit the individuals and community that you have called us to serve. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As I indicated, there are no citizens wishing to address the board, so our first action will be uh, item number four, which is the approval of minutes, which was the December 14th meeting. And uh, again, uh, if you have any discussion, be glad to handle that or any recommended changes. If not, I'd entertain a motion. I have a motion by Mr. Bose, second by Dr. Weber. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Thank you very much. Uh, I know the next action, Robert, I think last time, back on the 14th, I took all the time this year. This time I was going to say, as we start the new year, a lot of great things and opportunities face us. I just want to say one thing to, this, to Robert and the entire staff. You can't pick the paper up, and we haven't been able to do that for many, many weeks without hearing about the flu epidemic that obviously is, is there. And I think if you've been watching JPS and if you've been keeping up with what this staff and our professionals are doing, uh, they've done a tremendous job in dealing with this. So Robert, to you and the entire staff and for throughout the district, uh, please advise. We certainly appreciate the way you have the, uh, I would not question it, but just, everybody st stepped up, did the extra and took care of the patient. That's what's, what's important. So thank you all for that. Thank so you. anyway, and I'll, I would turn over to you for your CEO report. Um, a couple things. I thought we would get the meeting off today. If you would indulge me and in, in staff, we have a, a three minute video we'd like to show you. And this video really does take a look back at JPS over the last year. And this is the, the beautiful voiceover that you're going to hear on this is a soothing, um, spiritual, wonderful voice of Leanne Franklin. And Leanne Franklin and Kevin Fuji and our communications department got together and put this together. And when you look at the three rules of JPS, if you look at rule number one, which is ownership, it's kind and wonderful people like Kevin and Leanne that just got together and said, you know what, I think we ought to put this together. And uh, it's just fantastic. So if our, if our great technology team can um, pop the screen up behind me, we will watch a, uh, a video to kind of put you in your, your right place and understand why we all work in this place and why you as people um, come to these meetings and why we're all a part of JPS.
every day at JPS, there's new life, fresh hope. And that's what we give, life and hope and extraordinary care. And newborn squeezes and squishes and smiles, we give our best. It's who we are, it's what we do. In orthopedics, we give a hand. On the floors, we give late night appreciation. We give our hearts to those who lose. The beautiful voice I was telling you about, <laughs> You cannot hear. Uh, so what we're going to do is start it again, and hopefully you will hear the beautiful voice I described to you earlier. Every day at JPS, there's new life, fresh hope, and that's what we give, life and hope and extraordinary care. And newborn squeezes and squishes and smiles, we give our best. It's who we are, it's what we do. In orthopedics, we give a hand. On the floors, we Okay, third time is a charmer. Leanne, instead of hearing your voice, could you just give us another prayer? <laughs> could you could you just pray a little bit? That yeah. How, how strong are you? Can you have your spiritual workings make this audio work? It should go. What? Maybe you have to cut it off and cut it on again. Mm. Yeah. We're all very thankful that Chuck Weber and DT Wynn have gone into the control room. We just want to let y'all know that we have no fear. For the two people on our board you can never hear in the audience, we've sent them into our control room. Don't worry, JR's in there. She'll get the straight. Yeah, we do. Please, Warren, go in. Extraordinary. Yeah, care. and let us hear it out of there. And newborn squeezes and squishes and smiles. We give our best. <laughs> it's who we are. Just put the mic on there. In orthopedics, we give a hand. On the floors, we give late night appreciation. We give our hearts to those who lose loved ones. And we stand in awe at the choice to donate organs and give new life. It's who we are, it's what we do. We do real-life trauma scenarios for teens to know the shattered dreams caused by drinking and driving. We include real-life moms and dads so students can begin to imagine the unimaginable. The hope is that a crash in our trauma bay will prevent a crash on the highway. We make it real with the hopes of saving lives. It's who we are. It's what we do. We take behavioral health seriously and compassionately. We are centered in patient-centered care. We operate at the top of our game, every patient, every night, every day. We're always stepping it up as modeled by Dr. Duane, our giant in trauma surgery. We touch hearts and we fix them. Here, the thousand first open heart surgery at JPS. Our hands heal. Being a teaching hospital, we share what we know. We inspire the best in others. It's who we are, it's what we do. We listen and we care and we pray. We help one another. We get the big picture and we love on the little ones. Our patient family knows no bounds. Our hearts are as big as the community and our community teaches us as we serve them. We see that healing can affect hope in all kinds of ways. It's who we are, it's what we do. 
We hear from those whose lives we've saved. We love our diverse culture. We own it, except when the bull owns it harder. We celebrate the bravest acts of generosity. We put ourselves in our patients' shoes. Every day, in every way, we bring light and hope and the highest level of patient-centered care. At JPS, it's who we are. It's what we do. We look forward to what the new year will bring, knowing what we will bring to 2018. Um, even if the sound wasn't loud, you can see by those pictures who we are and what an incredible place this is. And those of you who come to our board meetings, um, I uh, appreciate it very much because you've seen JPS grow over the years. And Mr. Keeley, you in particular have seen JPS um, through its challenges, its trials, its tribulations, and you've helped us. And you come to all of our board meetings and you've seen the changes that we've made and what we're trying to do, and thank you. Um, thank you as board members because you're a significant part of what we do and how we do it. And um, Leanne, you and Kevin did a wonderful, wonderful job. Thank you very, very much. So I um, want to talk to you a little bit about the, um, we did a survey for, Robert, yes. Uh, that was just the thought from them to do the video. Yep, it was Kevin in our communications department getting together with Leanne and um, Kevin had taken those pictures and Leanne put words behind it and that was a great combination of people just coming together and saying, this is something really great we should do. Yes. That is a good marketing piece to go out in the community. It is. It is. And, and, and we see that. It's just a quick, you know, three minutes of who we are and, and what we are. So, yes, we will definitely do that. Thank you. Appreciate the comments. Um, some years ago, um, when, when Chuck Weber and Trent Petty and Steve Montgomery and some of those who have been on the board for a little bit of a longer time and Pastor Emerson knew that when we switched over to the electronic medical record, there was an immense amount of, of gnashing of teeth and wailing in the hallways and screaming and yelling and, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're going to do this and I have to input all this information and I have to do all this. Um, We've now had that process up here for the electronic medical record through EPIC for quite a while. And it has reaped dividends for our patients. Our patients now see better care, better quality. Our doctors, our nurses, our support staff are really understanding the value of what we do for the touching of a patient, the helping of a patient, but then electronically and technologically using that to the advancement of our patients. So we did our, a survey and found out that um, this survey was pretty amazing because we scored amongst our physicians some of the highest in the nation for their appreciation of our electronic medical record and what they thought and their comments. This is not a survey that is orchestrated in any way. It's a survey that basically says, tell us about the electronic medical record and what you think its value is. Uh, overwhelmingly, our doctors said that it adds to the quality of care that our patients receive. So um, it includes 7,000 physicians, over 16,000 clinicians using this throughout the nation, and we scored some of the highest numbers of that. It was pretty amazing, and we've been invited to their national conference um, to report out what JPS is doing from an electronic medical record standpoint. So I wanted to let you know that the evolution of time has helped, the acceptance of our team has helped, um, Melinda Costin and David Mendenhall and our IT department working with Dr. Slee when she was um, serving as the liaison to our doctors, uh, our new um, president of the medical staff, Dr. Schrader, and some of the people that take a different attitude towards technology and understand how we can use it and how it can be beneficial has really put JPS on a national map for its acceptance and what we're doing for the electronic medical record. And I thought you as board members kind of needed to hear that because when we first went down that venture, it wasn't so happy and it wasn't so pretty. And now it's come to be quite a tool for us. Are you going to go to the National Conference? Uh, no, uh, I'm not going. And it, it has, 
It has nothing. Yeah, I'm, I'm in a video, but it has nothing to. It, it probably has something to do with the flight, but it actually has to do with the fact that they didn't invite me. <laughs> so, where is it, Melinda? Salt Lake, right? Just on the other, just west of Dallas. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> yeah, not South Lake. Uh, so, but that is uh, uh, is really good, and I'm really proud of the team and, and proud of what we've done with the electronic medical record. Um, Charlie alluded to it earlier, or board chair alluded to it earlier, and Mr. Powell mentioned uh, flu cases. I wanted to give you some numbers behind the flu uh, and let you know that the number of flu cases at JPS continues to increase. Uh, we topped 1,700 um, cases of flu in the month of January. So um, if, if you would like to have the flu, we would encourage you to come to our emergency department and spend a little time. Um, but it is challenging this year. But what I find amazing is there are headlines in the newspapers and on television about facilities who are uh, not accepting certain patients and deferring patients elsewhere. Um, Dr. Schrader and that team down in the ED, every one of our nurses, every one of the people here, our surgery department, everybody else says, bring it on. That's what we're here to do, and that's what they do. So. To have a team that's that strong to deal with 1,700 cases in January and keep coming into work every day and keep dealing with it when your colleagues and your patients continue to have increased levels of flu, um, it's pretty phenomenal. The other thing that's phenomenal, and I know that there's, there's been some comments about this in the community, but JPS um, has vaccinated 50,000 people for the flu. If um, it's not too late to get a flu shot, if you are late in not getting your flu shot, we can still make accommodations for you. We can still get you your flu shot. Uh, I'm not a doctor. They don't play one on TV either. But I, I will tell you that there are the belief amongst um, even my own family members that if you get the flu shot, you won't get the flu. It doesn't guarantee you won't get the flu, but it is certainly a good preventative measure, and it probably helps in the severity of the flu if you get the flu. I know you as board members did a great job of bellying up to the bar and got your shots. Even some of our board members who don't like shots, and we won't mention any of them, but um, everybody, <laughs> everybody stepped up to the plate and, and got their flu shots, and I'm proud of y'all um, for doing that. But our team, uh, of dealing with flu has done a wonderful job. I'm very, very nervous because the next thing we're going to do is try to show you something on a video. Um, Chuck, you want to go on in? So we're going to attempt to do this. Let me tell you what we've done here at JPS, and you've heard about it before, but it, it's not to make light of it, but hand hygiene is so important in any hospital setting or clinic setting. It is literally gel in, gel out wash your hands, take care of things, take care of yourself. JPS, like all healthcare organizations, was struggling with that. It's, I gotta see this patient quickly, or I'm walking down the hall, or I'm gonna leave here, I don't think, or you know, you're, you're similar to what you did at home when you were five years old, you know, go back in, wash your hands kind of thing. What we have done at JPS is we took an approach that um, we would use a little humor and our communications department did a wonderful job of putting a set of commercials together to go out network-wide to, in a, in a funny way, remind people the seriousness of this and try to get our team to come in line. Those commercials, through our secret shopper program, because we can verify this, we are now at 80% compliance, and that's pretty powerful. I know you should be at 100%, and that's where we want to be, and that's what we're shooting for. But 80% compliance uh, is, is a, a, a testimony to our nurses, our staff, our team, our doctors, and everybody else. Um, we happened to have two individuals the other day that um, said they, they didn't gel in and gel out. Gel is those little machines you see in the hallways and the doors, and we have right outside of here. And they said, oh, we, we didn't need to do that because we used the sink. The only problem is you got to get your story right. You got to make sure that the room you're going into actually has a sink if you're going to tell us that you wash your hands in the sink. So we do a lot of checking on people. And uh, we're, we're trying to be, uh, in essence, uh, good parental units 
in dealing with this. So what I wanted to do is um, take the risk now and show you one of our commercials that we have. This is one of a series of commercials. Our next set of commercials will be a little bit more serious and we're going to interview our patients. And what we're going to tell our patients is you tell every person that comes in your room, did you wash your hands? You have the right to do that. And we cross over a lot of cultural lines, a lot of different lines in this institution, and sometimes people don't feel they have the right to say that. We want our patients to realize they are empowered to tell anybody that comes into that room, did you wash your hands before you come in here and please wash your hands before you leave. So this is our, our last of our humorous commercials, but we at least wanted to show you, kind of give you a tone of what we're doing. Um, Godspeed, J.R. Labby. <laughs> If we can't be sure our hands are clean, we just won't use them. I just wanted to take a look at your hand here and see if you can feel this. You're not using your... Just to be sure. Be sure. Clean hands. Better care. JPS Health Network. What, <laughs> what I said at the beginning is if we're not going to wash our hands, let's just not use them. So that is a commercial of not using our hands and what this place would look like if we didn't. Um, but that attempt at, um, at, at trying to take on a tough issue in that manner uh, has really paid off. So I just wanted to give you board members and some of you in the audience and anybody live streaming an idea of what we're trying to do to tackle a problem um, that is everybody in healthcare's issue. So, um, Mr. Board Chair, I have nothing else that I'd like to show you that you can't hear. We're done with Good. my report. Thank you very much. I I was very concerned when you talked about the board billing up to the bar or whatever it was. I'd be careful about that. <laughs> so, I do have one uh, follow up to the flu story. I it is. Reverend Emerson knows, being former chair, he come to a lot of meetings during this tenure. And so I was at a meeting here last week, and, and obviously with the flu going on, everybody was a lot of masks. I got on the elevator full of, whole elevators full of people on masks. I was the only person to have a mask on. Now, if y'all know what I do, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. If you know the profession I'm in, people wearing masks kind of bother me. <laughs> So I was like, wait a minute, why is all the people got masks on? Because I thought, anyway, long story is, again, tremendous job on what this entire district is doing. And, I, and again, on behalf of the board, I have the pleasure of sometimes speaking to the board, and I say unanimously, I think we're all in support of this. Great job for what the staff's done with the, this situation. Uh, then I will, we talked about Dr. Schrader, and I th next item on the agenda is item number seven. We'll go the, I think the first couple are for information purposes, and we're gonna take some votes on the individuals below. So, Dr. Schrader, all yeah, yours. So, so if I may, um, before we get down to business, Mr. Okay. Chair, um, first of all, thank you for having me. I can't tell you how uh, appreciative I'm, I am of the support of the board towards medical staff. Um, I did want to take an opportunity to provide two uh, areas of recognition. Um, as you know, in December, we had our medical staff annual meeting um, where we recognized Dr. Janet Miles as Physician of the Year for all the work she's done with the lab, blood bank, and pathology. And then Michelle Lightfoot as our APP, Advanced Practice Provider of the Year, um, for the 20 years of service she's put in um, to our hospitals groups, um, both of which I just want to make you aware of. That way, if you see them in the halls, um, you can wish them congratulations. Thank you. Uh, the, other, the other piece of business is it is busy as we walk in this room, but as you may or may not have noticed on the screens, um, 360 West, a magazine um, put out throughout Tarrant County, recognized its top docs again uh, throughout the, the Metroplex. 130 JPS physicians were named across 37 specialties. And to give you some, and just to give you some perspective, in 2017, um, only 45 only uh, 45 physicians were named as top doc. So we went from 45 to 130 uh, in that 12-month period. So, congratulations to all the physicians. Informational. So we'll move on, I guess, to business. Um, the first bit um, is informational for the board. These have been approved uh, previously. Uh, but it is uh, the recognition of Kelly Flood Schaefer as chair of OBGYN and Dr. David Moreland as vice chair of OBGYN. I don't believe any action is needed on that. Yeah. 
Those have been approved by the board in the past. Um, the Department of Surgery and the medical staff would like consideration uh, for Dr. Therese DeWayne to be considered as chair of the Department of Surgery. And I think for, yeah, I think for purposes, actually, if you'd go ahead and maybe mention the vice chair also, and we'll take one vote concerning both the chair of surgery and the vice chair of surgery, general counsel. That's fine. Okay. That's fine. So if you might go ahead and mention uh, uh, Dr. Gandhi also. Yes, Mr. Chairman. So um, in addition to Dr. Therese DeWayne uh, for consideration of chair of the Department of Surgery, the Department of Surgery elected Dr. Raj Gandhi as vice chair. Okay. I have a motion for approval. Any second? I have a second. Most of those. All those in favor say aye. Those no. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, the Department of Internal Medicine uh, made a recommendation to the board for the uh, consideration of Dr. Steve Davis as chair and Dr. Darren Kumar uh, for vice chair. Right. Again, uh, if there's any questions, uh, I'll be in. Dr. Strader, be glad to answer them. If not, I'd entertain a motion. I have a motion for approval. I have a second by uh, Mr. D.T. Wynn. All those favor say aye. Opposed, uh -huh. no. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sir, Chair. Thank you, Roger. Anything else? No, sir. Great. Thank you so very much for that report. Uh, the next we will speak as doctors. We'll talk about the claim. I think Diane is here. He is. Uh, Mr. Bradshaw, if you'll come forward to report on the claim position group, please, ma'am. Thank you. Good afternoon. So the claim continues to move forward with the vision established by our leadership and board. And over the last few months, I uh, would be remiss if I didn't thank our chairs and chiefs and our physician board who have been uh, stepping in at, with James's departure at the end of the year. They've been very strong partners. Acclaim continues to recruit very strongly. Thank you. We have 26 full-time providers joining between now and September of this year. Those are signed contracts, five floater PRN positions, primarily in specialty care. We do have some hard-to-fill positions. Those are uh, related to specialty providers, ENT, behavioral health, and dermatology. Um, those positions are with outside recruiters, um, and I'm happy to say we have two strong ENT candidates in the pipeline. One was we're here this week, so we're very excited about that. Those are just hard to fill. We've onboarded two new trauma general surgeons um, in the last couple of weeks. Dr. Van Johnson, Dr. Brian Williams are coming on board, and we have three additional offers out for that service line. We were very hopeful to sign our longest uh, hard to fill, which was a child adolescent psychologist, but she declined this morning because she does not want to take call, be on call, which is unfortunate. That was been on. Um, been on the list since we uh, went live with the claim. Last fall, in partnership with our community health team, we adopted a strategy really to onboard a larger float pool for primary care so that we can close the gap on access. That was one strategy. Um, we think we've been much more successful as access is improving. We also partnered with our um, with IES, with Chet's team, to uh, share some float pool folks. And so we have about 10 folks onboarded with the claim who also help us to close that gap. We've been onboarding additional advanced practice support for many of our specialty clinics as well. We traditionally had only had physicians there, but we're adding to our pool of advanced practice professionals as they can help us with a lot of the low acuity um, access while our physicians focus on the more complex patients. We've been running about 25 to 30 open uh, positions. It seems to be where we're going to stay, um, but uh, our recruiting team continues to get stronger and backfill those positions as quickly as possible. Some key focus areas for claim this year really are, now that we've onboarded all of our uh, chiefs and chairs, is to focus on our medical directors, that next line of leadership, and developing that, that team. We're working on building strong support for our advanced practice teams across divisions. Um, we're currently implementing pay for performance for our advanced practice providers. As you know, we worked long and hard on a plan for our physicians, and now our APPs are coming on board. And we're continuing to strengthen our culture of transparency, accountability, integrity, and patient-centered care that will contribute to higher patient satisfaction scores and provider engagement. We hope to implement a formal evaluation system for our provider leaders um, this fall, which would include 360 evals and competency um, assessment. And of course, we're looking forward to finding the right president for a claim this year. That's my report. Any questions for Diana? Chuck, anything else? All right, Diana, thank you so very much. We then get into our committee reports. Before I say this, Diana was sitting there. You know as a board meeting, you certainly have the right to attend any acclaim, exec committees, or whatever board member can attend anything they want. I will tell you, since Chuck chairs that exec committee, we meet early on Monday mornings usually, or thereabouts, and sometimes meeting with physicians are late in the evenings. Uh, since he and I serve via the bylaws in those positions, we have to be careful to make sure we don't show up with full quorum. But I just want to say, say if anybody ever wants to attend anything, you're certainly welcome. Uh, committee reports. I don't think the, Mr. Montgomery has the flu. I think due to 
a business arrangement. He had to be out of town. He sent me an email. We did go over the financial numbers at the Finance Committee. There was no major issues, so I don't think he'd have any other uh, things that he had to, to report in today at all. So I'll make that as an information. I will tell you it's hard to imagine that Sharon is not here today, but we already have, and if you noticed your committee meeting schedule for this year, there was some discussion last year that we didn't have a full board retreat. and that. So this year you will note we do have a board retreat starting in May. Uh, to start talking about the budget. Uh, Ralph, we discussed that last year about making sure we get those in. And then we we're also scheduled then to have another full board prior to obviously the final submission of that. So we, we in, in kind of watching the process last year, we made sure we inserted those into the process this year. And Steve's certainly aware of that and so Sharon. So I thank them for that. So uh, being nothing else on finance, I would then call upon the next item would be human resources. Starling. Uh, the Human Resource Committee met January the 25th. We have a couple of items on the uh, consent agenda that uh, uh, we will need to pull off and discuss in, in closed session. Okay. And when we get to consent, we'll get those and pull those off and then uh, discuss those and come back out for action. So uh, other matters, obviously, that we're going to have to have some uh, discussion or any approvals on is academic affairs. Institutional report and uh, Mr. Tricia, you'll come up. So, uh, board members, y'all will, will recognize yes. that we have, um, by, by uh, obligation, we have a annual report that we make from the academic affairs. Dr. Elliott um, has, has been with the organization now long enough to uh, know the <laughs> ins and the outs and where everything is and how we make things happen, and she's um, She's made some um, situations that are, um, I think, most beneficial for JPS and our residency program, but wanted you to uh, get the report from her um, at this time. Dr. Elliott, all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the board, for this opportunity to present to you and be a resource for you also for our academic affairs and our academic programs. We're going to present to you today the annual, let's see, I guess there's a slide for the next slide. Here we go. We're going to focus primarily on our graduate medical education programs, give you a bit of an update there, but we'll also put a bit of information in there under our undergraduate medical education programs and also our allied health and nursing student programs, which we put under the umbrella of clinical experience. So to review our graduate medical education programs, we are accredited primarily for our large programs. The Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, they accredit most of our programs, eight of our programs. You see them there. We have six residency programs along with two fellowship programs, our geriatrics and sports medicine or fellowship programs. And we have two other programs that are also uh, accredited by non-ACGME accrediting bodies. Our surgery program is an integrated program with our Baylor uh, colleagues and having our, our surgery residents here as part of our overall residency complement. We also have our ophthalmology residents. We don't have them listed there, but UT Southwestern sends approximately 30 residents to us annually here for that. So overall, we have around 200 plus residents that we train annually here. Just to give a little bit update of where our programs stand with our accreditation, all of our programs are really pleased to report that they have continued accreditation. Just to give you a little bit of background, the ACGME actually reviews programs annually, uh, usually doing that uh, at the late uh, time. We have to submit that information, usually end of August, and they have their review committees for the different uh, specialties that review each program annually. So the continued accreditation has to be a continuous process of accreditation. So we're pleased to report that each program has continued accreditation. We're also very pleased to report that our institution also has to go through a review, and our institution has received continued accreditation with commendation two years in a row. So we're pleased to report that. We do have a few programs that are anticipating what we call ACGME on-site visits this year. We're getting ready with our family medicine program, our sports medicine program, and our geriatrics program and our podiatry program to anticipate a visit in the late fall and uh, look forward to that as we prepare for that visit. This is probably one of the uh, 
best slides in the deck here. We're really excited to show the efforts of our programs, our faculty, our program directors, and of course our residents, as we saw that wonderful increase up to 100% for our institution, for our board pass rate. Of course, okay. one of the things we tell our residents every year is that we're trying to get board certified docs that are out there practicing, and so we're proud to be able to accomplish that. I'd like to share with you a little bit of information with regards to graduates. Our 2017 graduates, where they have self-reported that they are going to be practicing and where they've made those decisions. There were 76 graduates, 11% of them, around eight of them, stayed here at JPS. 22% were in other areas in the DFW area, meaning that we had 33% serving the DFW Metroplex area. We also had 26% stay in other areas in Texas. So on average, we have about 59% or close to 60% of our folks that graduate staying in the state of Texas, and then our 41% going outside of Texas. A little bit of note for our students, letting you know, we actually, with our uh, medical students, our nursing students, our pharmacy students, and our allied health students, we actually annually have around 2,500 students coming through annually. That's quite a significant number. We have, from the medical schools, they represent not only our local medical schools, uh, University of North, North Texas Health Science Center, uh, UT Southwestern. They also represent other uh, Texas schools and schools beyond Texas. We also have in our nursing, we have eight schools represented in our nursing programs here, UT Arlington, uh, Tarrant County College, TCU, Southwest Adventist, Tarleton, and Texas Women's, to name a few. Our pharmacy programs are primarily from the University of North Texas, UT Austin, and Texas Tech, and our allied health programs are from those previous schools we've also mentioned there. So you can see this represents affiliations with almost 90 educational institutions. We're a very active teaching hospital. To give you a little bit of focus of where we're looking at this year as we look at this academic year, uh, we are still preparing for our ACGME Clinical Learning Environment Review. You'll hear the term clear. Uh, this was presented to you a few months back, focusing on our six key areas. They'll be coming here to see how we're engaged as an institution and how our senior leadership is really engaged with our residents and how our residents and faculty are engaged. We'll be looking at this, this six key areas that you see listed there. Along with, we're also looking for ways to improve and increase our research and our scholarship among our faculty and our residents. And we're partnering, of course, with our resident directors, uh, research directors, and our residency program directors to be able to do that. We also hope to really kind of expand into interprofessional as we do all of the student activities. We're really trying to get that continuum of learning from your undergraduate learning, your graduate learning, and also now in CME, your continuing learning. So how do we really create that lifelong learner and look at some opportunities to develop our faculty as we know more students are coming and things like that. We want to make sure that they have the resources needed. And then, of course, a big one that we're looking at is how do we increase our graduate retention? I'd love to see that number get higher than 11%, and that's going to be a goal of ours. Part of that is just even starting with an assessment. So we're going to be looking at where we've been, and we're going to be getting some of that information to see how we can get that information from our graduates, uh, what uh, constitutes their decision and factors into decision making for practice locations and really try to do some targeted uh, efforts with our physician groups here too. really make sure that our physician groups are more visible for our residents so they really know that there are opportunities here locally for our programs and then we'll be collaborating of course with our current and our future medical schools here as we we grow and uh, look forward to those opportunities so thank you for this opportunity and I'm open to any questions Dr. Elliott thank you very much any questions Dr. Elliott I have a quick question on uh, the uh, graduate practice location. Yes. Do you track to see where they go within the uh, other Texas area? Are they coming home after they open up their practice? So or are they going back to their their homes? We have not necessarily asked that, but it's something as we're doing our graduate service. Mm -hmm. After the training that we have. Yeah. Would, trying to see if they go in home or they can't find a job and they have to go to a smaller market because the loan is pretty high after graduation. Yeah. We want to see how they're doing financially afterwards. Because at some point, we're going to have to 
That's something, yeah. That's something we can consider. We're going to be doing some graduate surveys and really trying to look at some trends and looking at what those factors are and those decisions. I will tell you the market, because of the physician shortage that we have in Texas, the market's pretty good. But I think what we have to understand is also where we are locally. I think you're right to see what our, what our shortage areas are and what our capacity is, too. It's 33 percent for the DFW area. Yeah. It's not high enough yeah. for uh, yeah. retention. Yeah. You're right. And it's also, you know, how do we match that and really track that, what those decisions are. We will do. Yeah. Thank you for that. Good yeah. The, yeah. Go ahead, Warren. Before I have my question, I, I point out, yeah, one of the problems that UTA has always had historically is that 70 percent of its graduates stay in the DFW area. So its name doesn't get out as well as, say, graduates of some school that might be located in in middle of Egypt somewhere, um, mm. south of here. Um, so, not referring to A and M, but maybe maybe I am. I don't know. Uh, look at me. So I thought he yeah. was talking about you. I thought he was talking about Austin. Oh, well, maybe yeah. Look at you. Then. Okay. That is the South Campus. Yeah. The, uh, okay. I'm sorry. The question though, I didn't see any numbers here as far as num uh, dollars. I'm always interested. You know, it, it's good is is this a money making deal? Is this a money losing deal? How much are the taxpayers putting in this? What are we getting out of it? That oh, kind of thing. Sure, um, sure. Can you tell me about that? I can tell you a little bit about that. I know graduate medical education definitely is a cost, but as we look at also the services that are provided by the resident workforce that we have in terms of 200 plus, and when you really do the numbers and the pro forma, there actually is some opportunity for some gain, uh, sometimes in anywhere from break even to gain. The way that we invest in that, looking at the different sources of funding that we have, from federal funding to state funding, we of course need to look beyond that too. I think we need to explore what are some other partners we can engage in this conversation around graduate medical education funding and, and supporting our student education also. And I think that when we look at the overall numbers, I think we at JPS, comparatively to other programs, are doing a fairly good job of being very cost effective about the cost that we do per resident. You'll see that nationally, oftentimes, the cost per resident is about $150,000 to train a resident. We average a cost here around eighty dollars to $90,000. So we're doing very cost effective care with high with high quality residents and doing a fairly good job with it. Is there more that we need to know? Yes, and I actually I'm going to be exploring a lot more to see how we delve in a little bit more into the financial performance of where we are. Let me also warn to that ad that if we took the residents that provide services and care to our patients and they were no longer part of our system and we had to replace them with DOs and MDs and specialists, sure. um, the financial impact yeah. to us would be so devastating we couldn't equate to the amount of physicians we would need to take care of the patient population that we currently have. So that provides us, as, as Dr. Elliott mentioned, that provides us an opportunity to offset some of that cost with somebody that's not the higher cost of an active uh, individual that's already passed the residency programs. And we're not constant benefits. You bet. I'm assuming that there are benefits that, are, that are very real and billable. You know, so sure. I'm, I'm just, I'd just like to see Absolutely. that. Absolutely. No, cost effective, I think, is also very good. And that's more information that needs to occur. And we can definitely look in the future to be able to provide more information. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for Dr. Elliott? I tell you, thank you very much. And thank I guess you, Mr. Only, Chairman. Only, Appreciate the opportunity. The only question I have, Dr. Elliott. Yes. Where do you go when everything's 100? That's a. <laughs> I know. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> <That's> been, <yeah. laughs> okay, congratulations. Those hundreds look great. And, mm, All right. Anyway, thank you so thank very you. much we'll for your We'll continue support. the effort. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item underneath <laughs> this, Robert, you may have a couple of uh, appointments that we need to make. So, Mr. Rule, we'll make uh, some. Mr. Money. Chair, what we have here is. Um, we're going to, uh, with your approval, uh, appoint Mr. Rule to serve for the Haltom City um, TERS, and um, that is one that, that I realize the, the date says 2020 in there, um, but that's a prospective date. And uh, also, we have no financial participation in that particular one. It's representation of JPS at the table. Um, so that's the, that's the first one. The other one, um, the Azel Turs, is we have 50% participa uh, participation in that one as well. I have a quick question before we leave this subject. Sure. The passing. What is our drop off, I mean, drop out rate for the residency program before they make it to the. Um, Dr. Well, you may want to. I was thinking that was a terse question. I was thinking, Mom, I'm not, <laughs> boy, I'm not getting it. Scott, um, you but I feel much that? better. <laughs> yeah, Please. Ahead, Dr. Elliott. With the 100% passing, yes. what, what is the drop, drop out rate uh, for the residency program before they get to the point where they take the 
Board. You mean in terms of our attrition, in terms of just before they get to take their boards? Right. We're actually fairly good. If we look at that, we're very low in our attrition, actually. And so it's actually quite good. I would say even less than less than 3%. I mean, we're really wow. pretty good, yeah. I just yeah, to absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And but, just to let you know, that board passes also around first-time takers and what they do. So it's really, really remarkable. Thank you. Great. Thank, you. Thank you again, You're Dr. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Scott. Scott Rule has not dropped out of any TERS or TIFFs <laughs> that I'm aware of. So he's at 100 percent there. <laughs> he, may, he may want to. And I know, Mr. Chair, we have to take these up individually. Yes. I would now consider the Halton City uh, as recommended by Mr. Early. I'd, I'd certainly entertain a motion for approval. I have a motion by Dr. Weber. A second by Reverend Emerson. All those favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. Thank you. Item number C, Reverend. Uh, C is the one that we have. It's a terrace in Azel, and that considers uh, us at being a 50% participant in that one, and that, too, would be the appointment of Mr. Rule. Uh, having heard that, I have a motion by Dr. Weber. Second. I have a second by Mr. Bose. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Put that on your resume, Scott. Yes, yeah, Scott, that'll look good. Uh, we, we come to the point in time for the consent agenda. I would ask for the approval subject to item number, Dorothy, correct me, I think it's item number N and item number zero that you asked to be pulled off right. will then be discussed and considered later. Yes. So with that amendment of the removal of item number N and number O, uh, if there's no other request for removal, I'd entertain a motion for approval of the consent agenda. I have Reverend Emerson on the motion. Second. Mr. Bose on the second. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, that will now take us down to item number 12, which is the legal counsel report. And I'll turn it over to general counsel, Mr. Adams. Uh, you had uh, on contract number 200, if I can find my file. Uh, well, I don't have to tell 28 contracts that were negotiated by the district that were uh, uh, under $200,000 for, uh, for the month of January. And then the last item posted on your web portal was fiscal year 2017 compared to 2016. I have some fiscal copies. Sorry about that. Uh, I have some fiscal copies here if you want one of those, but those were on the board portal for your review. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer those or give me a call. That's all I have. Any questions, General Counsel? If not, thank you very much. I will take us down to item number 13. Uh, we will take a short break here at 1.55. Make it about a five or ten minute. We'll then reconvene in closed session. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will now reconvene in open session, it being 255 this afternoon. And I would like to go back. We had some items pulled from consent, and we'd like to go back to item number 11 in. Uh, approval of the annual incentive plan performance metrics. Uh, Move Mr. approval. Mr. I have a motion by Mr. Bowes, a second by Dr. Weber. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. That motion carries. And right behind that also is item number 11 uh, zero, which is the long term incentive plan. And Move approval. I have a motion by Mr. Bowes, a second by Mr. Wynn. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you so very much on that. The next item of business will be for us to consider our privileges, and I will certainly call on Dr. Schrader at this time. Uh, thank you, sir. So uh, medical staff would like consideration of uh, approval of the medical and advanced practice professional staff appointments and reappointments uh, as presented. I have a motion by Dr. Weber. I have a second by Reverend Emerson. All those in favor say aye. Uh. Opposed, no. Thank you. The motion carries. Is there any other business to come before the board at this time? I am going to end on something here that we started the meeting, Leanne. They're not here, but I really enjoyed, uh, once we got the volume, I really enjoyed, obviously, I think it's a great new, uh, uh, it just has a great feeling about what's going on at JPS. And I think the final words were who we are and what we do. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we forget we're part of that too. So thank you all for your service. And if there's no additional, oh, excuse me, Reverend Nisham. Uh, it's 1.30 on, I know it's Monday, 
I'll get it to you, Ralph, just a quick second. We'll send out. Yeah, that's a good when point. We, There's a visit confirmation. We'll send it out on the board portal yeah. as well. Jr. has it. That there was a visitation and and the service, so okay. we'll make sure we get that out. There being no additional business to come on the board, we stand adjourned. Thank you. All right.